Welcome everyone to the second of our guest speakers in the in the DRA 2021 series. My name is Lee Dalzell and I'm the National Member Experience Manager for Disaster Relief Australia. Tonight we have the great pleasure of being joined by Hugo Tuvi, who is keen to share his story with you all. Captain Tuvi is a 29 year old army captain, founder of 25 Stay Alive, a commander welfare officer at headquarters uh, forces command in Sydney. He's an ambassador for mul multiple charities and he hosts a mental health podcast called Behind the Uniform. The last seven years of his life have been any anything but normal. We are we are all keen to hear Hugo's story tonight. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Hugo this evening. Over to you, Hugo. Thank you very much for uh, for having me, Lee. And and everyone else, it's um, you know it's the, the new normal with the, these virtual presentations, and I'm um, honoured to be sharing my story um, today with you, um, which will typically take about um, you know 40-ish minutes or so. And then if I've got um, any questions, I'm a, I'm an open book when it comes to any questions. So as Lee said, I'm still serving in the army. I'm currently a captain, um, been in for 11 years, and I currently work at the as the Command Welfare Officer at Headquarters Forces Command. So essentially work alongside psychologists, um, doctors and uh, medical professionals, really. Um, albeit I'm not a medical professional myself, <laughs> but uh, how I find myself there is is uh, basically through the lived experience of what I've been through um, and sort of my, my passions in in all things physical and mental health, which is what uh, what my story is about and what, you, what you'll find out shortly. So I'm just going to share my presentation now bear with me so hopefully you can all see hopefully you can all see that if uh, if you can't uh, maybe lee just share to myself or the presentation's not working but um look the presentation is titled uh, don't wait until it's too late and the reason for that is um, you know, th what I've gone through over the last sort of eight years now, the key message, uh, the overarching message is to um, not put off seeing your doctor, really. That, that's the overarching message. Um, and as, the, now, as mentioned by Lee, I am um, currently serving in the Army. I joined the Army in 2010. I think it's important just to do a bit of a background before I get into my story itself. Um, that photo is an interesting one. I went through what's called the Australian Defence Force Academy for those vets in the room who are, who are officers who have gone down the ADFA pathway. That's where I found myself. It's three years at ADFA, 12 months at RMC, Royal Military College, Duntroon. And now the reason I start off with this photo here is, you know, those five gentlemen you can see, and I'm obviously the sixth, third from the right, third from the left, sorry. They're still my best mates to this day. In fact, yeah, uh, it was only three nights ago, and we did a bit of a a virtual poker catch up over a couple of beers. Um, you know, for for half of us, we're still, we've been in lockdown for a couple of months, so we're still very close. But unfortunately, the gentleman you see in the middle there, uh, who's not present with us at that day and anymore, is his name was Peter Bark, and unfortunately, Peter Bark took his own life. Um, second year Adfa. Peter was one of my best mates. He um his room was right next door to me. We shared some fond memories together over the, the couple of years at Adfa, but unfortunately, he um, he did take his own life at just the age of 22. And it was really, really tragic um, to say the least, but I always remember being a pallbearer at his funeral, a military funeral. I was only 19. Being a pallbearer at one of your best mate's funeral is not exactly what you, where you think you're going to be. But as I found out through the, the next eight or eight years or so, Unfortunately, there, there are going to be things in life where you don't think you'll be or you don't think will happen to you, and that's life. Um, and it was, uh, it did teach me a lot at those early years about mental health and the impact that someone's loss um, through suicide can really have on the wider community. Um, and I'm still really close with Pete's mum. We catch up every every year or so. She lives in Brisbane. Um, and I guess throughout all these presentations I give, Pete's always a big part of these, and I'd like to think he's looking down and in a way proud of, of what I'm trying to trying to achieve. So look, moving on, I 
Um, eventually graduated ADFA, like I said, through a difficult moment in there, and it really drove me to wanting to, to graduate uh, for Pete. Went across to RMC, which is also the known as the Royal Military College Dan Troon, um, for the final um, and at this stage, I was uh, 21, I was fit, I was healthy, and I had six months to go before I graduated as a young lieutenant in the Australian Army. But it was June 18, 2013. Now, I remember that date pretty well because it's my dad's birthday. And I remember wishing my dad a, a happy birthday, I gave him a call and um, said, look, Dad, on a completely unrelated side note, I've got this um, this lump on my testicle. What, what, what do you think? And I remember my dad said, how long has it been there for? And I remember it's probably been there for the past six months. Which, you know, listening to that or hearing me say, it's ridiculous that I, I little lump off. But the reason I did is because I was 21. I didn't have any pain. I was the fittest I'd ever been. And like a lot of young 20-year-old blokes, you, you don't really think much of your health at that stage. I had no family history of cancers or any significant illnesses, and and I just put it off. I was hoping it would just disappear on its own. Um, but my dad said, look, mate, why don't you just... <laughs> this is the worst military. We, we have it pretty good when it comes to um, health care and seeing your, your military um, yeah, medical officer. And for me, my MO was probably the best part of 30 metres from my room. 30 metres, and I put off seeing him for six months um, until I finally did see him. And I remember he pulled my dax down, had a feel around, set me off for an ultrasound later that day, pulled me back in and, and said, sorry to say, mate, you've got testicular cancer. That was a bit shocked because I thought having cancer meant you had to be unwell. But here I was you know, smashing BFA times and smashing field exercises and going on you know, the pub on the weekends with mates and living like most young blokes live. But here I was being told I had cancer. Um, and I knew nothing about cancer. But as you can see there, look, testicular cancer strikes young. It's the most common cancer in young men. Yet I'd never heard of the thing. Um, so look, it, it was a bit of a difficult time to process, but at the same time, I kind of was pretty ignorant of the fact that I didn't think it was that serious at the time until I eventually started having follow-up scans which showed the cancer had spread. Um, but before I go into to that, it's um, I'm a Movember ambassador, hence my uh, my CD Mo that you probably saw at the start. I um, seem to get pretty attached to it, so I can't really get rid of it. So I um, keep it most of year <laughs> until my partner's um, disgust. She really doesn't like it. Anyway, <laughs> um, the Know Thy Nuts, you can see there, it's a funny little, funny little story. So when I'd just been told I've got test testicular cancer, it's a pretty serious, uh, pretty serious thing, right? But one of the first things my um, surgeon said, my urologist said, um, now look, we have to have surgery to remove the affected testicle. But some important things first, do you want a fake testicle? And I remember thinking at the time, well, yeah, look, I suppose I was single, um, you know, I wanted a bit of normality. I thought, yeah, why not? Let, let's chuck in the fake nut. And um, he pulled out, and I'm not making this up, pulled out this briefcase, um, opened it up, and it had these little sort of shapes and sizes and molds basically where these fake testicles sat. <laughs> and he would pull one out and say, this one's imported from the US. You know, this one's, in, you know, one of our most popular silicon-based ones, and I'm feeling them and pushing them down. And I thought, oh, this is my favourite. Finally picked one out. He said, right, what size do you want? And I said, well, if you match it up with the other guy, that sounds about right. And he said, well, mate, it's not uncommon for some blokes to want a bigger fake testicle. <laughs> for whatever reason, looking back on it, now I've got a bit of an infamous drunken party trick. I kind of think, okay, I kind of see what, what, what people are going for there. But um, look, that's a uh, <laughs> a uh, different conversation for, for another time. But uh, look, I, I try to use a bit of humour through my journey and here I am you've just been told you got cancer and I'm, I'm, I'm laughing with this urologist who I don't even know about fake testicles and it really helped me get through that pretty traumatic experience 
And now I look back on it almost fondly with a bit of humor as opposed to being, you know, a really sort of emotional time, if, if that kind of makes sense. And, and look, I, I do urge for, I don't know how many guys are listening to this right now, but I do urge all the blokes listening to this. You can set yourself one goal tonight, especially if you're a bloke under the age of 40. One goal tonight, after this presentation, have a shower, think of me. Well, <laughs> that's <laughs> okay, Matt, maybe don't think of me. Think of the presentation, <laughs> think of the messages, but just have a feel around and know thy nuts. And it's a simple, simple thing to do is to know your nuts. Because I had that little lump on my testicle for over six months. I knew it was there, but I didn't do anything about it. And that brings me on to the particularly the cancer had spread upwards. So you might be familiar with a guy called Lance Armstrong, he, um, the famous cyclist and, and the, also the, the drug cheat, which people know him as, but also a testicular cancer survivor and his cancer spread right up to his brain. He had less than 10% chance to live. So it can spread if you leave it. Mine had spread a bit. Um, it spread through all my lymph nodes, spread to my chest, my liver, my lung area. And rolled in having to have, you know, months of chemo and follow on surgeries and treatments and a pretty um, full on couple of years because I put that lump off. Um, but I, I, I could still graduate RMC at no debt to my health. So I kind of put off graduate. Uh, so I put off chemotherapy for about three, four months, uh, which was difficult because I kind of had to put my RMC hat back on, focus on my training, pass the assessment course I need to pass, knowing that I had cancer through my body. So that was a real kind of mentally that was really difficult. But I graduated on the far left photo. You can see me there with my twin brother, Max. It was a camera with family, friends. And after four years of military training, I, I was proud. But it was a, a bittersweet feeling because although I was just graduated as a young lieutenant in the Australian Army, on the other hand, I knew I had to embark chemotherapy and I did that as little as six days after graduating. So that was tough. Um, through chemo but that middle photo now yeah, photo is me probably two rounds into chemo now i've got sort of puffed cheeks and i'm a bit chubby because it was the steroids that i also took whilst i was on chemo now the reason i'm mentioning this photo is because it was probably the first time i went out in public with my shave because my chemo you lose all i lost all my hair and um you, you really aren't well and you're, you're quite pale and fatigued and some days are a struggle, but it was the first day, first night that I went out in public. And I hadn't told anyone, my, hardly anyone, what I was going through because I was, I just felt so vulnerable and I felt embarrassed in a way. I didn't like the way I looked. Uh, anyway, I was a good mate's 21st. I went to the 21st. I remember standing there during the speeches and I was speaking to a mate I'd not seen in years. His time. I saw you, you know, you're in the army, blah, 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 all the small chat. And I said, yeah, look, I'm actually pretty unwell. I said, um, unfortunately, I'm, I got bloody told I got cancer. I'm currently going through chemotherapy, hence, you know, my hair and the way I look. And I remember Tom looked at me and his mouth opened and he said, mate, he said, I'm so sorry. I had no bloody idea. He said, I thought you had the whole you know, clean shaved head, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, you know, hard military bloke, just finished by RMC. He thought that's what, that's the look I was going for. He said, mate, I had no idea. And it just goes to show that in life, in life, we can often be our harshest critics. We can often think that whether it be friends, colleagues, we can think that people are judging us in everyday life. Even when you walk down the street, we've all done it. Whether you think you've got a bloody pimple on your head or you're receding your hair or you put on a bit of COVID kilos and, you know, you think that everyone's judging you, but often we are our harshest critics and that spotlight you think that's on you and I thought that was on me at that given time often isn't the case. So since that moment, I've, I've always tried to kind of not be so critical about what I think others are thinking and actually just, you know, be happy for, for what I am and, and what I have and, and who I am. Um, which I think is a really powerful thing. Um, but look, unfortunately, the chemo didn't quite do its job after about six months of chemo. 
in and out of hospital. There was still some um, cancerous lymph nodes. So I had to have what's called on the far right there, retroperineural lymph node dissection, bit of a tongue twister, which is essentially a eight hour operation, 30 meter incision down my front to remove all um, 65 or so abdominal lymph nodes. Um, pretty full on. I see you for about four weeks, lots of recovery. But the key of the whole testicular cancer story was that I eventually got the all clear scan and I was cancer free. So all the recovery from then on didn't matter. I knew I'd get through it, but most importantly, I was cancer free. And it's funny how when you get those things in your life, everything else seems to be insignificant, where for me, all I wanted to be was cancer free. And look, if you ask me mid chemo or mid surgery or through what I've gone through since then, which you're about to find out, at that point in time, you think that nothing, nothing will ever get better. If you speak to anyone who's experienced severe mental illness, they, they say the same thing. They think that at that point in time, life will not get better. But it's a matter of, you know, if I wish I could tell my old self when I'm in those real dark moments, or you could tell yourself if you're in those dark moments that it will get better. And COVID is a fantastic example of that when people are out of jobs, um, you know, they're going through ex extreme challenges, that it will get better. And it's so hard to see that. But then for me, it just it just did. Things just get better. And you look back on it and go, shit, where did that time go? And, and life goes on. Life doesn't pause. Life doesn't pause for these 11 o'clock press conferences I wake up and watch every morning or to pause for case numbers of COVID or pause for people going through cancer. Life goes on, days go on. And that's what happened. And for me, I found myself and I, and I was fortunately cancer free and I could start living my life. And I traveled to New York and got promoted to the captain there. I'm pitching with my, with my dad, middle phone. Right? Usually, and on the far right, I'm, I'm pitching posted to Brisbane. And, um, you know, as a captain posted to Brisbane, I felt like it was a fresh start. And I suppose the cherry on the cake, if you want to call it that, was June 2018 was when I got my five year all clear for the testicular cancer. Essentially, for, the, for those who, who have been impacted by cancer, it, it means that you're, you're effectively in complete rem remission. So I remember opening the bottle of champagne, cracking the, the, the verve, cheering my partner. And, you know, it was a proud, happy moment. The first time in a long time, I felt free. I felt like you see on the far right, got behind me on my desk right now in a nice big white frame because that, you know, every time I look at it, it makes me really happy. Um, but unfortunately, this is where um, life can be full of unexpected surprises. And um, you know, that feeling I'm talking about of that happiness. I said about two months and in August 2018, I found myself back in the doctor's rooms due to some stomach complaints. Now, the difference from young 21 naive Hugo who had that little frozen pee on his right testicle that I put off for six months. Fast forward five years, I was 26. I was more proactive with my health. And now I was more, more I guess, aware of changes in my body. So my bowels started playing up, inconsistent bowel movements, a few sort of abdominal cramps. So it prompted me to go off to the doctor, which I didn't do five years prior. And so I went off for a colonoscopy. And, and for those, I'd like to say more, more senior gentlemen in the room or, or women who have had a colonoscopy, it's a pretty si uh, simple procedure. Camera up the bum, has a look at what's going on, um, a few biopsies, and that's what I had. I remember waking up from the colonoscopy, eating a little turkey sandwich, had my tea, my little biscuit. And the doctor said, look, mate, there are a few nasty little polyps. Um, but hey, look, probably nothing. We'll see you in two weeks time. And I didn't think anything of it. I went to work the next day and then I got a call from my whose name was Terry. I got a call. And um, she said, uh, look, you, you got the and uh, look, Terry needs to see you. 
And I remember thinking, yeah, yeah, no worries. I'm due to see him. I pulled my phone out and said, I'm due to see him in two weeks. And she said, uh, no, no, he needs to see you this afternoon. And I remember just having this sinking feeling in my stomach thinking, this is not good. Um, and, um, you know, I just knew something wasn't right. And my partner's a nurse and I went to, fortunately, she had just finished a shift. So we went to the um, appointment together in Brisbane. I was 26 at this stage. Two months before that, I just given a, I just got given a five-year clear scan for testicular cancer, but I just still felt like something wasn't right. Um, and then Terry called us into his rooms and he sat us down. He turned his computer screen around and said, "Look, mate, I'm sorry to say, um, but you've got bowel cancer." And hearing those words was just such a punch in the guts to quite, <laughs> quite literally, because you know I felt like I'd kind of really just smashed testicular cancer I'd, it had been a full-on few years but I felt like you know yeah I, I, I got the better of it whereas here I was being told I had this different cancer now for those thinking or for those um, wondering right now it, it was completely unrelated it wasn't a reason testicular cancer this was an entirely that actual colonoscopy results you can see on the screen there and you can if your eyes are really good you can see a couple of little like weird little chubby finger looking things they're um they're the polyps and those little chubby finger looking polyps were um were cancerous um and so it was you know i knew bowel cancer look survival rates are good bowel cancer well it's the second biggest cancer killer behind lung cancer uh, in fact, one Australian death every two hours. Um, so it's a serious cancer. It's now the biggest cancer killer for those aged 25 to 34. So it's not just an old person's cancer. Here I was being told I had bowel cancer. But, but the only positive, the only silver lining was that I got it early. And I remember as clear as day, the doctor said, mate, we got to act quick. I've already booked you in to see a surgeon. We've got to get some of your bowel removed. We've got to start acting quick, but we've got it early. We've got it early. And as you can see, they're up to, if detected early, 99% of bowel cancer can be successfully treated. So in a weird type of way, my testicular cancer saved my life because there is no way, there is no way if I didn't have testicular cancer, I would have rushed off to see a doctor for my bowels playing up. You know, they weren't that bad. But because I did, it essentially saved my life. And it's um, it's something I look back on. And one of the key messages from today's presentation is don't wait until it's too late. Because you just never know. Uh, look, there, there was the moment when I walked out of that doctor's rooms after just being told I had bowel cancer at the age of 26. And I remember I just burst into tears. I feel like I just, I, I just had to let all my emotions out. And to this day, one of the hardest things I've had to do was leave those rooms and and call up my parents. Now, I didn't even tell my parents I was having a colonoscopy. But I remember calling my dad up and, you know, dad's not really an emotional guy. But I remember calling my dad up and saying, um, look, dad, I've... Uh, I've got some bad news. I've um, just been told I've got bowel cancer. And I remember fighting back the tears and I could hear my dad fight back the tears and get really emotional. And it was one of those moments where I, you know, realised that something like cancer, something like mental, any mental illness, and it doesn't just impact you. It didn't just impact me. It has this ripple effect, you know, it impacted my partner, my family, my twin brother, my parents, my my friends. And although you can't help it, and although I couldn't help it, I just felt this sense of guilt because they're, they're they're along for the ride. And it's um it's a really difficult time to try and have that, you know, that brave face. And unfortunately, that's what I tried to do over the coming years, is that I had that sense of optimism and that brave face, but ultimately I was you know, kind of just putting this mask on, this front on, which was really difficult. Um, so look, after 
having a big chunk of my bowel removed in 2018 and going on immunotherapy treatment for six months and radiation treatment and trying every diet under the sun. And I went vegan for a while. I gave up drinking for six months. I, I gave it everything. Uh, unfortunately, um, there was still some cancerous um, cells in, in my bowel. And essentially, um, in October 2019, so probably a year after I got that initial diagnosis, my surgeon said to me, look, mate, we've tried as much as we can, but we got to now take the next drastic measure, and that's to remove your entire large bowel and rectum. And he said, if we don't do this, it's not a matter of if the bowel cancer will spread, it's a matter of when. And he said, and when that happens, we're having a different conversation. So look, I guess looking at it that way, it was a pretty easy decision to make, but I knew it would significantly impact the rest of my life. Um, but I had to do it. Sometimes you have to make those hard decisions. And um, I, I did that in, in October 2019. I had another major bowel operation to remove my large bowel and my rectum. It was about a, I was in hospital for about five weeks. And you can see a little pouch there, and it's, it's a Baxter pouch, a TPN pouch. That essentially kept me alive for about um, two or three weeks when I could not eat or drink. Um, and I'm just having a sip of water now. And um, I couldn't even do that. I couldn't even have a, um, a sip of water for about three weeks. I lost 22 kilos. I was really, I've had so many abdominal surgeries up to that point. I think it was about number six to that stage. My stomach just did not want to wake up. Um, so I was kept alive through a tube through my nose from a pouch and it was a really bad time. So much so that the, the surgeon didn't think I was going to get through it. Um, and I started to have to have those conversations in my head and start planning on what it might look like if I didn't get through it. And that's something that most sort of 26, 27 year olds or anyone really ever has to sort of think about that. Um, but the photo you see on the right, now I'm sure you're looking at that. You can see I'm unwell, physically I'm unwell. I've got what's called a, a stoma, which is essentially my small bowel sticking out of my stomach. And that's how I go to the, that's how I went to the bathroom. Um, you know, I've lost weight. I lost about 20 kilos. As I said, I've got scars. I've, I, I'm not well. But it's the face that does it for me. And every time I look at that face, I feel so sorry for that person I see in that photo. Because I, I was so, so unhappy. I'd put on this brave face that every time I had a visit to my partner, my dad, my brother, a mate, anyone, I'd put on this brave face and kind of crack some jokes and pretend everything was fine. But as soon as everyone left at night, every night, I'd burst into tears and so much so that I'd, you know, ask the nurses for as much sort of legal painkillers I could to, to dose up and try and help me sleep and just numb the pain. Um, so I was in a pretty bad way. Um, but it wasn't until I got a call from my doctor, my military, uh, my medical officer, to ask how I was going. And I remember as clear as day I said to him, I said, look, yeah, look, I'm okay. My, my bowel started, my stomach started to wake up and they could introduce a little bit more food and water and things started to look better. Um, but I was still in a lot of discomfort and pain. But I remember saying to him, look, but mentally I'm struggling. And as soon as he kind of said, no worries, and he gave me a mental. It all just seemed so seamless. But at the it, it had taken me so long to look after my mental health. Yet you can see in that slide alone, I did everything I could to look after my physical health and to, and to rid my cancer. I'd... I tried every treatment and medication and did everything I possibly could and had drastic surgeries, everything I could. Mental health. If anything, I just put it all under the carpet and just did absolutely nothing for it. And for someone who's never experienced mental illness, the best way I can explain it, had really dark, dark day and had ongoing battles with my mental health. When I was at my really darkest days in hospital, that mental pain of what I was feeling was worse than that physical pain. And that's kind of a way to relate it to someone who's 
has never really experienced to go, look, if, if they've got someone in their life who's going through a really bad time and who might be severely depressed, it's an illness. It is an illness. Just because you can't see it on the outside like you can in that right photo, it's an invisible illness and it needs to be treated as such. Um, and that's something that, you know, I think the awareness is getting better, but we've we, we got to do more in that space. Um, but moving on, I eventually did get discharged from hospital and, you know, it's the little goals. Day by day, it was walking 100 metres. It was, you know, not walking with a, a frame. It was eating more. It was, it was getting discharged from hospital. You just have these little goals that you tick. And it's funny in everyday life that for me, having a shower by myself was a massive achievement. Yet in everyday life, we seem to just find little things to pick at and, you know, whatever that might be, someone buddy road rage or you got served the wrong meal at a restaurant and these insignificant things, which in the scheme of things shouldn't matter. Um, but it was in April 2020 when I had the opportunity. So I have, a, you can see there, Ted. So Ted's my stoma. Um, also known as the Osme bag and I went to the beach had no top on I had these kids coming up to me and they'd say oh what's that so I thought if I had a little face on it it was easy to explain so I did I had a little smiley face on him and gave him a bit of a personality a bit of a name and ultimately as much as he annoyed me and I had to have bag changes and there was all sorts of stuff going on he, he saved my life so I was pretty grateful for Ted but there's an opportunity in April 2020 where I could have surgery to remove sorry to reverse Ted and what they've essentially done, although I don't have a large bowel or a rectum, now I really want you to get back to year 10 biology here. I have a little bit of my small bowel left. And what they've done is they've stretched down my small bowel. They've created a bit of a J shape inside. They've stapled the small bowel onto itself. And in the bottom of that small bowel, they've then stitched onto my anus. So <laughs> essentially, they call it a little J pouch. That small bowel J pouch acts as my small bowel, large bowel and rectum all in one. And, you know, that's how I now go to the bathroom. So look, instead of going to the bathroom, you know, two times a day, I might go 12 times a day. So a bit more than the average punter, but I get used to it. It's my new, ultimately, I'm bloody grateful for that, that I can still sit here and, and you know, usually stand in person face to face and and, and share that story um, and that part of my journey. Um, but now sort of to the back end of the presentation, hopefully the more uplifting, inspiring part, it's, it's been quite down to this point, but there's a reason for that. It's to show what I'm doing now and to kind of have that bit of that sense of optimism and that whole light at the end of the tunnel. So for me, there was a time when, you know, I felt like I had two options. I could play the whole victim card, life sucks, why me, which I still get down days, but that's normal. Or I said, you know what, I've got this unique opportunity to make the best of a bad situation here, to use what I've gone for. Bloody powerful, not probably, there's not many 20 year old blokes who have gone through what I've gone through, but I can use that to maybe help people. And I remember saying, if I can help one person, that'd be fantastic. And and that's what I set out to achieve. And, you know, I ended up um, becoming a, an ambassador for November. And, um, you know, I do a lot of work for them. Um, you know, I do a lot of work with the AFL and giving presentations and, and um, you know, resilient stuff and just basically just being me and, and just sharing my story, which, um, which I don't think there's anything special about it, but it's, I suppose it's just connecting with people and, Bottom right there, I am um, early this year, uh, pre-COVID, I did an 84 kilometre walk over two days for a bowel cancer charity, um, raising money for, for bowel cancer and ultimately just doing what I can to, for the community and for myself. Um, and I've also been fortunate enough to meet some really inspiring people through my podcast and through my own charity, 25 Stay Alive. But um, I thought it'd be relevant to put this photo up here because I don't know if any of you are watching the Paralympics at the moment, but there's a gentleman called Kurt who's an army veteran he um, won gold last year hopefully he win two gold uh, in Tokyo so uh, keep your eyes out for Curtis but anyway the reason I vote is he is the ultimate 
example, of our Curse's story, he was a combat engineer in Afghanistan. Essentially, his job was to clear IEDs from the road, so the um, you know the the infantry guys can can drive through. Unfortunately, one afternoon he stepped on an IED and it blew off both his legs. And there was a time, and he he shares this story himself. There's a time he said when he was getting stretched off, where he said to his little section, "It's all right, guys, you'll see me in the Paralympics." Now, at that time, he had no desire or any thought of being in the Paralympics. It was just his way of instilling that bit of you know optimism and. I guess what the Australian Army are quite good at, that that lightheartedness, sense of humour until his mates to try and say, guys, it's all right, I'll be fine. Well, a few years later, after learning how to walk again with his uh, artificial legs, went out there and won a gold medal <laughs> in the Paralympic Games, which I think is fucking amazing. Um, so there was a time when I was standing next to Curtis, done a little bit of work together, and he's done some talks with me for Army Days, I said to him, mate, those are fucking impressive, those bloody artificial legs you've got there. You know I mean, he's this tall, strong, muscly guy. I'm like, but gee, they must be like, how do you do it each morning? And, you know, must it must take a lot to get used to. And he said to me, mate, honestly, honestly, I don't even know. I don't even remember what it was like having legs. I don't even remember any different. He said, this is just me now. This is my new normal. And as soon as he said that, it kind of, really hit home because after living with a stoma and an ileostomy bag and you know essentially shitting through my stomach and then now having to go to the bathroom a dozen times a day and having issues and you know yeah there can be some days you know an inconvenience but I don't think much of it because it's my new normal it is what it is like so be it like it's just other people go through struggles on a daily basis this is mine and that was Curtis's and it's who we are and crack on and, you know, look what Curtis is doing now. So it was a really powerful thing he said to me. I remember. And look, I, I did create this community called 25 Stay Alive, which essentially is all to do about educating, inspiring the younger demographic to be proactive with their health, with that concept of you're never too young. You know, that, that whole mindset of don't wait until it's too late and, um, you know, we do work workshops, presentations, um, you know, we, we did a podcast, but, um, you know, we're in talks with the government at the moment and Medicare about, um, a, a, you know, an initiative whereby when you turn 25, you can get sent a, um, a list of all the local GPs in the area. And essentially it's a complimentary appointment to go see your GP and you have a an annual health check. Um, and basically you build a relationship with your GP. You have all your key health things at that age and it just puts you in that mindset at a younger age. Because at the moment, men especially are very bad at seeing their doctor. And I think it's something that um, hopefully we can all see in the coming years. But um, right, so there's my story for now. Look, <laughs> it wouldn't be any good military presentation <laughs> if I didn't have an acronym. So I did create my own acronym. And um, the acronym is called ALIVE from 25 Stay Alive. And all five of these messages or key, I guess, takeaways from what I've learned over the last eight years and things that I truly believe can save lives. And that's ultimately why I'm sharing my story today. So if you take anything out of this presentation other than for the blokes to fill yourself, fill your nuts in the shower, um, you know, hopefully you can take away a couple key points from this ALIVE acronym. Look, the A from ALIVE is act on symptoms. You know, acting on symptoms. And I don't just mean physical, I also mean mental health. There are certainly symptoms for mental health um, and look what they look like. You know, I, I probably don't have the time for this presentation. I also give mental health um, presentations. But what I essentially want to want to say with Act on Symptoms is the overarching theme for the presentation being don't wait until it's too late. If you have a symptom, symptom of any shape, size, form, whether it be a an unusual mole on your arm, whether it be your bowels playing up, whether it be for women having a an abnormal lump on their underarms or their breast area, if you have a symptom, act on it. End of story. Because early detection saved my life. And if it wasn't for me going to the doctor to get my bowels looked at, I would not be here today. So please 
act on symptoms. The L in alive is look after yourself. Now, it seems obvious when I say, oh, yep, look after yourself. What I mean by that is self-care. I feel like during this whole COVID pandemic especially, you know, we can let a few things slip, you know, but I'm not just talking about going for a run or eating healthy. We, we know those things. Get the right sleep, eat healthy, drink enough water. You know, I'm, I don't, yes, that's important. I'm not just talking about that though. I'm also talking about, you know, your mental health, your mental fitness, as I like to refer to it as. And if I got, you know, show of hands, which I can't obviously see any hands, but if I said show of hands, you know, this week, how many of you have put specifically put time aside for your mental fitness? There might not be that many hands. If I asked the same question and said, what have you done for your physical fitness? There'd be hands up. I've done this. I went for a run. I played tennis. I went for a ride. I did some push-ups. But we seem to neglect our fit mental fitness. And if you refer back to that photo of me with no top on standing, looking at myself in the mirror, we often do that. We often tend to just kind of brush our mental health and our mental fitness to, to, the, to the side and, and neglect it. But we should be putting just as, if not more, emphasis into our mental health and our mental fitness than we do with our physical. But only five things that works for you. If you've got a work colleague that comes on, you know, you know, Monday morning talks about how he's just ran a, a bloody marathon or he's, you know, you know, just good 45 Ks or whatever, that's great. Good on him. Give him a pat on the back. But ultimately, find what works for you. Me, I like going for long distance runs. I like short runs. I like playing tennis. Um, you know, I personally like yoga. Whatever works for you, that's what's important. The I in alive is initiate conversations. I'm a massive one for conversations. As you can probably tell, I love talking. <laughs> I love generating conversation, discussion. Hopefully there are some questions at the end because I do like talking uh, and, and most importantly, connecting with other people. But that's what's important there. It's staying connected. Initiate conversations, stay connected. So another little challenge that I set you, and there's no way of me knowing if you're going to do this other than set yourself a little challenge. you have shown up tonight. You're listening to me talk. So what I want you to do with initiate conversations is to reach out to someone you haven't heard from in a while. Now that could be a friend, colleague, family member, someone you haven't heard from in a while. And if you're struggling to think of who, open your contacts up and just start scrolling through your contact list. I'm doing it right now. And as soon as you see a name, yep, Charles Inglis, boom, jumps out, click it. And if you got haven't spoken to him for a while, her for a while, just send them a simple text. You don't even have to call them because sometimes a simple text message is all it takes. And I can say from a firsthand experience over the years when I've struggled, when I've had an old mate reach out with a little text message saying, hey, Tubes, how are you going, mate? You know, I was thinking of you the other day. Remember that time at school when we did blah, 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 blah. It just changes my mood. So that's a bit of a challenge. And, you know, if Lee, <laughs> if, you're, if you're still uh, still watching this, you too, you know, everyone watching this is just pull out your phone after this presentation and reach out to someone you haven't heard from in a while. And then you'd be surprised how good it makes you feel just connecting with that person, just going, you know what, that, that makes me feel really good. And then they might reply and you go back and forth, whatever. And then try someone different each week, every second week. The V for alive is a visit your GP. Now, this one's even more prevalent, more prevalent than ever during COVID because so many people are putting off seeing their GP during COVID because they fear that either what they're seeing their GP for isn't important or they don't want to be around the, you know, hospitals and, you know, risks of getting COVID, et cetera. Now, I can tell you firsthand, having worked, well, having worked closely with some leading charities, some of the data at the moment for early screening and detection for cancers is not looking great. And what that essentially means is that the last 18 months or so with the, the focus rightly so being on, on COVID doesn't mean that we forget about everything else. And I, there's a slide earlier on I said life goes on. Well, so do cancers and mental illnesses and other illnesses in life. It doesn't just pause because of COVID. It doesn't go into lockdown for eight weeks. So I urge you all to visit your GP. And even listening to this now, a bit of a prompter for, a, for a, a question, when did you last see your GP? When did you last see your GP? Now, if you're sitting there thinking, shit, I actually can't remember, or some of you probably think, shit, I haven't gone since bloody I was a kid. 
it's not a boasting thing about, oh, I haven't seen the doctor for fucking 20 years. We should be seeing GPs annually, having annual checkups. I guarantee if I ask the same question, when did you when did you last get your car serviced? Oh, you know, I got my bloody, you know, you know, Volkswagen Tiguan service three months ago and I've got the new tyres and I use premium fuel and blah, blah, blah. But have that same mindset for yourself. You know, blokes especially, we, we seem to be so much better looking after our car than we do ourselves. So I think use this as a bit of a trigger, bit of a reminder to go, you know what? I probably do need to book in to see a GP. And my partner recently just did it. She went in for an annual checkup. She got the bloods done, did all the other stuff that, you know, females might do differently to men. Um, and then she got everything done, annual checkup, happy days. It's simple. She walked out and said, that was great. That was easy. Um, so just build that relationship up with your GP because it's bloody important. And finally, the E for alive is express your emotions. Now, it's a good one to finish off with. I'm in a pretty, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an emotional guy. And I think that's a good thing. It's important that we express our emotions. You know, we should be feeling comfortable expressing how we feel. And I think, you know, it takes courage to be open, honest and vulnerable. It's, it's hard to do. It is hard to do, but it's so important. And I think, you know, I keep saying men because it's a, it's a big part of in what I do, but women as well. You know, there's no, there's no shame in seeking help. There's no shame in putting your hand up to say you're struggling and, and expressing how you really feel. I think too often we put on this masks at mask and we just kind of, you know, shy away from how we're really feeling. But that's just crap. We don't, we don't need to do that. And, you know, anxiety, depression, suicide, I've touched on a lot of it today. And I talk back to the second slide of the first slide I put up of my late mate, Pete, who tragically ended his life. And I'm sure everyone on this call knows someone who has been impacted by mental illness or suicide. And statistics are alarming. You know, that last point there, it's, I need to update that. It's on average nine people in Australia take their lives every day, seven of whom are men, seven of whom are men. Recently, Lifeline uh, recorded their highest ever numbers, over 3,000 calls they received in a single day due to people struggling during the COVID pandemic, over 3,000 calls, which, you know, it's great to see that people are accessing services like Lifeline and, and calling them, but just goes to show that there are so many people that are doing it tough, especially at the moment. But ultimately, it's realising that there is help and expressing your emotions, you know, taking that mask off, that goes a long way in the right direction and, and putting your hand up to say, you know what? I might need some help. I might need someone to talk to. It makes all the difference. And um, that kind of leads me on to, got a few slides to go with before we hopefully take some questions. But, you know, I do do a mental health, a host a mental uh, health podcast called Behind the Uniform. Um, and we're partnered with Movember. So if you're interested in podcasts, it's completely non-for-profit. I don't get paid a cent for it. It's just purely a passion project that I do. I host it with a, a really inspiring young doctor, really passionate, motivated doctor. But last season, we interviewed 10 guests um, and we're about to launch season two. We launch it around November every year, the month of November. 10 part mini series. They're easy to listen to. It's not heavy, depressing conversations as such. It's more uplifting, but talking about the important conversations when it comes to mental health. Um, so feel free jump on Spotify, iTunes. Like I said, we've got some new episodes coming in. One of those guests was a guy called Gus Wallen, who's a big mentor of mine now, um, who we interviewed last year. I don't know if you've heard of Gus. He's a great, great guy. We text every day now. and Gotcha for life charity. It's just gotcha for life, mate. Someone who you can talk to doesn't matter if it's three in the morning on a Tuesday night, you can contact them, warts and all, and just share how you're feeling and there you've got you for life, mate. And I think that's bloody important. We don't need to have 50 friends out there and, you know, popularity contests. If you've got a couple close friends in your life, that's 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 the important thing. That That's all that matters. Use those mates. Speak to them daily. Speak to them every second day, whatever it might be. But just be in each other's lives. Connect, communicate. It's all about um you know yeah connection at the end of the day so look thanks for for listening to my last um you know 45 minutes or so 
I, you know, it's never easy sharing my story, um, especially talking to a you know laptop screen. I, I'd much prefer doing it face to face and knowing who I'm talking to. But you know, the reasons why I do it is to hopefully you know help one or two people for whatever reason that might be. But you know, one one of the key areas which I really try and live my life by and. I still see a psychologist every few weeks. I've got I've got work to do. No one's perfect, but ultimately it's that life is bloody precious. So don't take it for granted. And I think, you know, we can often take take it for granted, but it's not until you sit back and really value what you have and not what you don't have when you realise, you know what, I'm doing all right. Yeah, I could have a bit more money. Yeah, I could have a better relationship. Yeah, I could be living in a bigger house, but ultimately, for the most part, I've got my health. You know, I've got a couple of close group of mates. I'm doing pretty well. I've got a bloody dog that's sitting at my feet right now, and <laughs> he, keep, he keeps me um, keeps me company and always puts a smile on my face. But it's ultimately just remembering that the last pretty bloody precious, and it can be taken away pretty quickly. So um, be grateful for that. And finally. The, you know the, the main reason I do what I do is is you know just read okay hopefully take some questions um this is from a young soldier who reached out to me last year and he said hello sir I hope all is well I had my 12 monthly surveillance checkup last week and so far so good chemo has done its job I could not help but assume it was fate that literally within 48 hours prior to finding the lump I heard your story it was daunting being an IET and having to walk into the doctor's room with something that could have ended my career. I thought about ignoring it, putting it off, and hoping it was a cyst. I was fortunate to have seen your story, someone in a similar position, be so open about their experience, and that gave me a lot of confidence and courage. I can't thank you enough for sharing your experience. So, you know, I, you know fortunately, I, I do get a few of those messages and I say fortunate because it, I, I truly feel humbled by those messages and there is nothing more rewarding knowing that you've potentially saved someone's life it's bloody powerful and it over the last 45 minutes of some of those really you know difficult times that I've gone through it makes it all worthwhile and it truly truly does um to know that I potentially uh, made the best of that shit situation and, and help people uh, like Declan here so um Anyway, that's, uh, that ends the formalities of my presentation. Um, thank you for your time. Um, feel free, and I truly mean that, to reach out privately you know, through Instagram, um, send me an email. Just yeah, feel free to reach out if you want to chat. I uh, will always give my time up for anyone who gives their time up to, to say good day or to reach out. So, um, yeah, look, we have time for questions now. If there are any questions. I'll um, stop sharing my screen and um, I don't know how the questions work on this thing. If people want to, un you know, unvideo, hang on, why isn't this working? But yeah, feel free to type in questions. Lee, I don't know if you want to um, yeah. facilitate that at all, but thanks very much, ladies and gents. Thanks, Hugo. Um, that was that was an amazing story and um, thank you for sharing that with us. We do have a few questions. Um, I'm not sure if you can see them. Can you see them on your screen or not? If not, I can read them out. Um, no, I don't, I don't think I can see them. It's like a little question mark. Got with a a event, if you wanna, uh, yeah. yeah, it's just, you just loading up. Oh, cool. It's just loading up. Cool. All right. Feel free to read one out though if it's um, all right. So, so the first one um, is from Kieran from Melbourne. Um, young men these days, one often finds a lacking personal insight and often lack any self awareness whatsoever. Trying to teach them to stop and reflect can often be like talking to a wall. What, through your advocacy or podcast or work as a welfare officer, is the best way of cracking the nut and get through to these young lads? No pun intended. Yeah, great, 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 Kieran, was it Kieran that asked that question? Kieran, yeah, Kieran from Melbourne, yeah. Kieran, yeah, thanks, Kieran, it looked great question, and it's, honestly, it's one of my, bad, like, one of my missions and one of my, my challenges that I face um, all the time, um, and to be honest, 
I sometimes I struggle to get across to some close mates. Um, so sometimes I think, fuck me, if I can't get across to some of my closest mates in my life, whether it be through encouraging to seek some professional help, seeing their doctor, what hope do I have? The best way I, from experience, I've found is, and I had a slide up there, um, um, being open, honest, and vulnerable, and lead, that's the biggest one. So the best way I've done it before is leading by example, putting myself in that vulnerable position first, putting my guard down, showing them that it's all right for them to put their guard down. And, you know, one of the best boss I've ever had, um, he's a colonel. Last year, I admire him greatly. Last year, he um, he's a very well-respected guy, a colonel, his commander. He sat me down, private one-on-one, and he just opened up to me and shared something very personal in his life that was quite vulnerable in his life. And he shared that to me, and I respected him more for doing doing that and expressing some of the things I was going through. Um, so it's just a prime example that it doesn't matter what age, you know, rank, et cetera, what you're doing in the, in the outside world. Often if, you're, if, often if you're struggling to crack that, you know, that young bloke uh, or getting through to them, I think leading by example, expressing your own vulnerabilities can go a long way in doing that. Um, and I've found, I've given some of these presentations some senior crusty old buddy Warren officers who um, in the, the room who, you know, arms crossed or whatever by the end of the presentation and through some Q&As, some of them are having tears in their eyes, opening up and sharing some of their own personal stories as well. Um, so I figure if I can get through to some of them, maybe there is hope. <laughs> but thanks for the question, Kieran. Cool. Thank you for that. Uh, next one. Um, how long did it take you to come to terms with your new situation? And that's from James. Look, um, it's interesting. I, when I first called my stoma Ted, one of the other reasons I called him Ted was the stoma nurse the old days before I could even look at my stoma because you've literally got your small bowel sticking out of your stomach. And I remember it took me four or five days to even look at it. And the stoma nurse said, look, Hugo, this might sound weird, but I, I suggest you call your stoma, give your stoma a name. Give your stoma a name because it might make necessary part of you just gives it a bit of a character and, and I did I was watching that ran little talking Ted, Ted um and uh, it actually did help me it really did help me so and uh, little things like that um got me through that and then there was a stage where I'd be so public and then there were times where towards the end I go to the beach with no top on and I was proud when I, I wake up maybe three times during the night to go to the bathroom. But as my dad tells me, who's 60, that's not uncommon for blood. <laughs> when those times frustrate me, i.e. whether it was my stoma, whether it's going up through the night, whether it's having days of just not feeling well. I was a matter of when I was in hospital, you know, being kept alive by a bag, didn't even know if I was going to get out of hospital. And I always go, holy shit, I've come a pretty long way. I'm giving a presentation today to, you know, some people who do some amazing work. You know, that, that's pretty awesome. Uh, you know, so I kind of have that perspective piece, which helps me, but not perspective in terms of comparing to others, but perspective in terms of my life. So um, that's how I've really come to terms with, with how I, who I am and my current living situation is that ultimately it's a shit time better than having cancer and not being here. So... <laughs> Ultimately, that, that sort of thing, right? But thanks for the question. Cool. And the next one um, is from Kim. Uh, what activity do you engage in that you feel improves your mental health outlook on a bad day? Yeah, look, that's a really good question. I think one thing I'm um, big on is not putting too much pressure on yourself, especially when you're having a bad day. Nothing worse than when you're having a bad day and you pick up your phone and there's this, you know, positive bubbly person on Instagram saying, you know, do you wake up at six and do morning yoga and do this and do that <clears throat> because it just makes you feel more like shit. If you're not doing that, you think, oh, I'm useless, right? So the biggest one is not putting pressure on yourself on those bad 
days and it's finding something small that you know you it's all good and well having to do can't achieve because that will just be counterproductive but if you like have a lemon water in the morning take dogs for a walk just to get outside at the local cafe, um, cafe little things like that setting yourself literally writing it down though which is what i do most mornings I try and this just with a few really achievable tasks because then I kind of get back and I go, I've already achieved three or four things this morning. And that makes me feel better as well as going for a bit of a walk with the dog. So that's something I really recommend you, you give it a crack. It's just that little achievable to-do list. So it's something small, something minimal like or have a little lemon water in the morning. Um, something as small as that, you go, you know what? I've started the day well. So you don't have to put these big meditation hour and go for a five day. Um, and I think that will go a long way to having some of those better days. Cool. That's good. Good answer. Um, last question is, is, is from me. Um, so so basically uh, you've been through this massive journey and you've come out the other end and it's it's fantastic that you're kind of sharing your story with us. Um, what kind of training um, would you advise uh, people to, to do to help um, people get through things that you've been through? Yeah, look, it's it's a great question and there is a lot out there. Um, as far as training goes, look, something I'm, I, I really got a lot out of myself in the last sort of six months. And I don't know, Mental Health Australia, but I, I don't know if you've done that particular course, but it's it's a, an amazing course. It can be done virtually during COVID. I did mine virtually. Um, I've done a few mental health related courses. This was one of the better ones I've done. Mental health first aid qualified at the end of it. You're technically a mental health first aider. You get sent this. Actually, you get sent this um, mental health first aid, which I call the Bible, from them, Mental Health First Aid Australia, and it's got some amazing tips, tricks. It's it's well well written. Um, it's it's really well written, and you get that for when you complete the course, and that's what the course is all based around. This, this book. Um, and that's and that as many of you nominate yourself for a course, it's not that expensive. Um, I don't know if you, you know you can get it funded or whatever, but it's, it's not that expensive. Like I said, you can do it virtually online. And that's one great way. It's all about you don't need to be a psychologist. And you're all capable um, of knowing how to help people close in our lives if they're going through a few difficult times and if they're struggling. So that's one thing I definitely brilliant thank you okay well that basically brings us to the end of um of, of the talk and the session um so we'd just like to thank you on behalf of dra and um we would like to offer you a little something and obviously if we were live and in, in in person we would we present you with something but we'll pop something in your inbox just as a as a thank you to say um thanks very much for your time tonight um yeah, so in, unless there's anything else that you want to do, what I, what I will do, and if you're happy with this, is um, I'll, I'll leave the kind of the inbox open. And if there's any further questions that come in, um, I'll forward those to you and you can respond um, to our members because there might be some things that people have, have, have haven't mentioned tonight that they want to kind of ask in the future. So if you're happy with that, then um, I'll do that and send those questions through if there's any further ones. Please do, Lee, and um, no, thank you. One thing we can all give up in life is our time, and I appreciate you giving your time up. Um, and it's, you know, as cliche as it sounds, it's true. If one person I can help through the last 60 minutes or so, um, then it truly is worthwhile. And as Lee said, if you haven't asked a question now and you would, you know, really like to ask something, and if it is, say, a bit more private, um, feel free to contact me directly. And I, and I do mean that. Um, if you didn't grab my email before, feel free to grab it off Lee and Lee, happy for you to pass that on. Um, grab my email, reach out, um, say good day, ask any questions. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. But thanks again, ladies and gents, and thank you, Lee, for the opportunity. Thank you very much and hopefully see you again soon. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone.